really excited to kick off our first seminar in our breakout series. Welcome everyone to Seminar One, Vibrant Flavors of Miami. Um, we are grateful to our sponsor, Kiko Munn Sales USA, for supporting the conference and this session in particular. If you're looking for the recipes for this session, they are available in your app. So if you go to the app and then go to the agenda, click on this session, and you'll see the recipes attachment that you can follow along um, or, or go back to them afterwards. They are also available on the conference resources website Website. So um, if you're having any trouble with that, you can go to the conference resources website as well. With that, I'm very excited to hand it off to our moderator for the session, Kathy Nash Holly, who is the uh, editor and editor in chief and founder of Flavor in the Magazine, Flavor and the Menu. I haven't had enough coffee this morning. So without uh, further ado, Kathy Nash Holly. Thank you. Thank you, Shara. Thanks everyone for being here bright and early after our first night last night, which was amazing. So it's incredible to get a good turnout uh, the morning after. Um, this session is going to be really interesting. And having spoken with both of these chefs, I know will be a lively and um, engaging uh, session. And you will learn a lot from these guys. And there is one common theme here. These guys are both Miami-based. And the, um, uh, the, the exciting thing about what they're doing, they're, they're, they're showcasing different complex cuisines that are very integral to Miami's culinary culture, but to their own respective culinary cultures. And both of them share a mission in uh, protecting and preserving their respective cultures uh, through their use of culinary ingredients and recipes um, respective to their, their homelands. So, um, I wanted to kick it off. We're, gonna, we're going to bring in, um, first up is Diego Oka. He is executive chef of Lamar in uh, Miami. And here we are, chef. Are you ready to roll? Yes. All right, perf, yes? Are you mic'd? We ready? Okay, perfect. So, Chef Diego Oka, let's, uh, let's kick this off with um, a walk through how you are preserving and, and protecting and furthering the cuisine of your, uh, your interesting merging of cultures. Well, hello everybody. Thank you for this opportunity to share my experience and my culture and some dishes. Uh, uh, well, I'm gonna talk, we're gonna make a, I'm lucky that you already saw a video of Peru. Uh, Paola is my friend. So I'm glad you have a, a great uh, explanation and you saw all the type of potatoes. Peru have more than 4,000 type of potatoes and we're gonna do one of my most traditional favorite dishes that we eat in Peru, no? This is a dish that you can find it in all the families in your house. Uh, everybody love it and it's very simple and of course we use the potato. Mm -hmm. uh, in Peru, we use for this causa potato, it's called papa amarilla. Uh, but here in the United States, uh, we use p Idaho potato. Okay. Uh, for this dish, we need a very low uh, a content of water in the potato because we're going to make a cold potato puree. Great. Uh, hey. Usually in Peru, we, we, we boil it. But here, because the potatoes here have more content of water, we can't, so we steam it, okay. no? Chef, we were going to play a quick video. Do we want to do that right now? Or do you want, what, yes, do you want to start the video first and then go into your potato dish? Whatever you think it's, yeah, let's Good. put the video. Let's do that. I think yeah, that because I did a video because let's, it's let's like my that. introduction. <laughs> yes, right. El gusto para la cocina no, comenzó como un gusto por la cocina y poco a poco se convirtió en pasión hasta que ahora estoy 100% seguro de que me voy a dedicar a eso toda mi vida, ¿no? Nací en Perú, eh, tuve la suerte de poder y comenzar a viajar por el mundo a los 22 años. Eh, viví en México cuatro años, viví en Colombia dos. De ahí me mudé a San Francisco y de ahí hace siete años vivo aquí en in Miami. Hello. Hello. How are ¿Cómo you? defino mi cocina? Definitivamente peruana de base. Eh, 
soy 100% peruano, me he criado en Perú toda mi vida, soy orgulloso de ser peruano, pero también soy orgulloso de tener raíces japonesas. ¿no? Mi papá es pintor, hace abstractos en acrílico y he estado rodeado siempre de arte. Y eso también ha alimentado mi pasión y mi creatividad y poder expresarla en la cocina. En verdad creo que como cualquier persona creativa, los 365 del año no eres creativo. Hay momentos en que estás en blanco y hay momentos de un rush de creatividad donde tienes que aprovechar esa inspiración que no, de, no sé de dónde viene, pero tienes que aprovecharla. Flor de papa es una preparación que me inspiré en hacer en una causa. La causa es un plato muy popular en Lima, está hecho a base de papa, de puré de papa frío, se mezcla con limón, con sal y con aceite y se rellena de varias cosas. Lo más tradicional puede ser atún con un poquito de mayonesa, limón, de ahí va una lámina de tomate, una lámina de aguacate y se termina de nuevo con el puré de papa. Escogí este plato porque es uno de mis favoritos para comer. Era cómo podemos elevar y llevar una causa tan rica, tan simple, a un nivel muchísimo más alto, sin tener ingredientes súper caros. Great. Thank you. That is one elevated causa. Yeah, so, so let's see this. Okay. that's the dish that we're going to do, no? Uh, Fantastic. So I like to, to play around. Uh, I love art, I love design, I love architecture. I think if I, I knew more about architecture when, while, when I was in high school, maybe I would be an architect, but I didn't have the information. <laughs> so uh, I went to culinary school and, well, I love it. I really love it and I'm glad I didn't research more. Uh, so, uh, for today we're going to do a causa, it's going to be, it's very simple. Uh, first, of course, the ingredient is the most important thing when you cook. So, for today, for this event, we flew especially uh, for this event, this fish. This is a steelhead trout uh, from Peru, and this has been raised uh, in a lake, in a very natural lake. Uh, at 12,000 feet above sea level in Peru, in the Andes Mountains. So no antibiotics, no chemicals, and the product is so beautiful, the taste is so beautiful. Actually, in the restaurant, I took out the, the salmon, and we're using only Peruvian trout. Uh, so we're going to mix two traditional dishes. Uh, one is the causa, the potato one, and then we're going to do a very traditional uh, sauce, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Peruvian food. I'm sure you try huancaina sauce. Uh, huancaina is a pepper sauce, usually with yellow chili peppers, with cheese, crackers, uh, milk, uh, and confit onions and garlics. But for today, we're going to use rocoto. Rocoto is another Peruvian pepper. It's a red pepper. Uh, I confit these before, so it's uh, garlic, onions, and rocoto peppers without seeds and without veins, uh, and we're gonna make a sauce. So we're gonna put the confit of rocoto peppers. This is a spicy sauce. Rocoto is a very flavorful uh, pepper, uh, and it's a spicy. Uh, rocoto is a family of the chile manzano from Mexico. Uh, they have a similar shape, different flavor, but they're related. Okay, so in Peru we have the rocoto, and in Mexico they have the uh, chile manzano. Okay, now we're gonna use uh, whole milk. Okay, you can use uh, actually in the restaurant now uh, we're doing these uh, vegan, and we use uh, oat milk and we use uh, uh, feta vegan cheese, and it's. It works really good. So if you're vegan, you can replace it. Uh, so I'm going to blend. I'm going to add 
asfalt. Huancaina sauce, uh, but with rocoto. The story of this Huancaina sauce is that uh, Huancayo is a city in Peru, in the Andes, and there was a lady that used to make this sauce with cheese and peppers and, and, and onions, uh, and she was so famous that selling it with boiled potatoes. We use, usually eat this with boiled potatoes. It's like a salad. And that's why they call Papa a la Huancaina. So because to the person that lives in Huancayo, they're called Huancainos or Huancainas. So that's why uh, this dish that is very popular in Peru uh, got that name. So I got the cheese. We're gonna add salt and crackers. And then of course, before I already cook the potatoes, we steam it, then we peel it. And the secret of the texture of this potato is that, is that it has to be uh, mashed, pressed, uh, when it's very hot. When it's uh, warm, when it's cold, you're not gonna take this texture because the starch from the potato will get cold and that will be like a, an elastic type of uh, potato dough, no? Okay. Perfect. So, you're gonna help me put it on the squeeze bottle. And then we're gonna continue with the uh, potato. Uh, so, I already explained to you that we have the, the potato. The, the delicious part of the potato, the causa, is the texture. Of course, the flavor, but the texture too. So it has to be silky, smooth, uh, no? And usually, I don't know if you can see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, it's very, you see it? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, this is yeah. the texture. So, um, so we're gonna add aji amarillo. Aji amarillo is another Peruvian pepper. Uh, usually in the, most commonly in Peru, we give a process to the peppers. We never cook, we cook it with the seeds or the veins. Uh, usually we make paste. So to take the spiciness from the peppers, so we clean the vein, the seed, and then we boil it three times. So we, we put water, the peppers, boil, throw the water, put new water, and we do that three times, and then we blend it and we make a paste. With this paste, uh, we do everything. No? We do ceviches, we do tiraditos, we do causas, stews, soups, but we always give a process to our peppers. So I'm gonna, you saw in the video that the, the causa was uh, pink. Uh, the pink one is made with uh, beet puree. So we, we cook the beet puree, and I think I need a bigger one. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is a traditional one with ají amarillo. But you can put whatever you want. You can put, uh, you can put uh, spinach puree, basil puree, so it, it goes green. Uh, you can use your creativity and you can you can put whatever you want. Uh,
Traditionally, we don't put it in a pastry bag, but because this is like innovation rate mm -hmm. interpretation, so uh, we decide to make a, like a very traditional causa, but I think I love tradition. I think everybody should start, like young people ask me a lot, I, where should I study, where should I work, no? Uh, and I tell them, like, my, when I studied culinary, I, I was obsessed with uh, French cuisine because I went to a French school. Mm -hmm. And I was all about uh, creams and butter and, no? But I didn't knew about my country, no? My flavors, and I think if you are uh, a cook, a chef, you have to learn first your, your origin, your roots, no? Even though my family is Japanese, I'm third generation Japanese, uh, my, my parents told me, why don't you go study, uh, why don't you work in a Japanese restaurant? And at that time, I was very ignorant. Uh, and I said, no, sushi, like in my house we eat sushi, sashimi, no, my grandma do it. And for me it was like, no, that's so easy, just raw fish and a plate. <laughs> And, <laughs> and I said, no, I, I don't want it. I want French cream, butter, uh, no? Yeah. Uh, but yes, yeah, those things that you don't know, no? When you're young, you just focus on one thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but now, of course, because of my experience, I tell everybody they should learn first their culture. And then, like, you're not going to go to France to to teach French cuisine, no? So right. you have to go to France and teach them how to cook Peruvian food. So mm -hmm. that, that happened. I learned a lot about my country. And I went to a Japanese restaurant and stayed there three years. So I did it. Uh, and I, I didn't regret. It's the best experience I had. I think technique, everything is great. So I need a bowl. And it was a small bowl. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to do the tartare, so we have nine minutes, we have to run. Mm -hmm. So I chopped the, the trout, the steelhead trout, uh, and we're going to do a, a tartare. You can, you can do whatever you want. Uh, I'm going to put onions, chichimi. So this dish is a Nikkei dish, okay? So it's a Peruvian bat with Japanese flavors. And we're going to use Kikoman uh, sweet chili. Mm -hmm. Translate Nikkei for anyone who may not know the actual literal translation. Uh, Nikkei uh, means uh, Japanese people that live in another country. Mm -hmm. uh, but in Peru, uh, we're the third largest uh, community of Japanese people in the world. The first one is Brazil. The second one is here. And the third one is Peru. Uh, and in Peru, a lot of uh, uh, Nikkei uh, chefs mm -hmm. uh, start this movement about uh, Peruvian food with Japanese uh, influence, no? And now the number seven in the world by San Pellegrino, at the San Pellegrino list is a Nikkei restaurant in Peru called Maido. Uh, so if you go to Peru, you're going to have amazing Japanese food, uh, no? And also, it blends because in Peru, we're very lucky that we have uh, a, a very rich Pacific Ocean uh, where we have, oh yeah, thank you. A very rich Pacific Ocean that we have different type of seafood, uh, no? The, cold, the Humboldt Current and the Del Niño Current gets together in Peru, in the north of Peru. So it creates a, a lot of microclimate, uh, a lot of temperatures in the water. So there's a lot of variety of fish, no? Uh, we're very lucky, especially to be a chef, a cook, and being Peruvian. I think it's great. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to put a little bit of fresh wasabi. I'm going to add a little bit of Kikoman sesame oil. And yeah, that's it. Then, uh, I did, this is uh, avocado alioli. Uh, so it's just a blend avocado. Uh, thank you. 
I have trout eggs. So we're gonna start plating. We have the causa, we have the tartar, and then we have the bocado and some flowers. I went to, I was looking for a dish, a plate, and I, I went to the river. <laughs> and then, <laughs> I said, this is perfect. Local. It's local. So uh, yeah. I wash it, huh? okay? <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, we have three dishes outside. <laughs> so, I'm gonna, it's called flor de papa. It, it means uh, the potato flower. And this was inspired also in the Peruvian folklore. It's uh, the music, the dresses, the people, no? It's very colorful. You have purple, yellow, uh, pink, okay? So I'm gonna put a little bit of the one kind of sauce. Hop. And then we're gonna cover the potato. Okay. Very easy. Mm -hmm. You're getting some nice architectural experience right there. You're you're filling that that need. It's beautiful. Yeah. Okay. And we're now form it with Okay. And then we have the we have some green, some flowers. Choose you have questions? You have questions. five minutes, perfect. Five minutes? Yeah. Of course, these are edible flowers. So the, the idea is that it's like a, it's a very simple dish with simple ingredients. And I like to, to do like, not saying cheap, but like very, uh, how you say, like, like um, simple like ingredients. Simple, yeah, yeah, rustic. But how to, mm -hmm. to do it like super high with yeah. design, with, yeah. No, because traditional things have a lot of flavor. You don't need to change nothing to tradition. So right. maybe just the plate, maybe just the story. No? Mm -hmm. uh, well, taking the, the humble ingredients of your culinary culture and making them into something inspirational and aspirational is really, really a way to keep innovating. Yeah. So I'm gonna use the vocal. So typically you would see a purple color here or are there any other colors that, that are popular? Well the or the purple you do comes from the kind of a more beet. Well, period. the first one is pink, no? Okay. We use more different pinkish. colors. We can yeah. do it black. Yeah. Uh, but the original was made with uh, the pink color. Yeah. Because that's a color from if you go to Peru, if you've been to Peru, Very like bright. the dresses yes. of the ladies, no? The colors, uh, mm -hmm. purple, yellow, green. But the fuchsia, how do you say fuchsia? It's not pink, but it's fuchsia. Fuchsia. Fuchsia, mm -hmm. fuchsia yeah. So we're gonna finish it with some smoked trout eggs. The clock is making me nervous. <laughs> like, I'm, All these yeah. eyes on you. Yeah. So, looks pretty. Yeah? Yes. Ah, yeah, and I found this also mm -hmm. on the river. Oh my God. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I think I like it, right? Yeah. Wow. So be patient. In the market, we're going to serve it. So imagine how, how much we're going to take to make 
200. Uh -huh. uh, no, I'm kidding. That's We're going to change the presentation, but the flavor is going to be there. Uh, That's beautiful. And yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Right. Thank you, Kiko Man, for inviting me. Thank you, World of Flavor, for inviting me. Uh, and yeah. And thank you for inspiring us and, and educating us on, on the great uh, culinary culture of your homeland. Thank you. And see you in Miami. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you, Chef. Thank you. It's wonderful. All right, uh, quick transition over to our next guest chef. Um, Michael Beltran also has similar passions and good friends with Chef Diego here. Um, uh, both of them really actively promoting their, um, their respective, as I mentioned, their respective uh, culinary cultures. Um, chef Michael is, uh, is executive chef at, um, at um, Ariat. Chef owner, I'm sorry, chef owner. Um, I told you I was going to be loose with your bio. I didn't know if I'd totally botch your, your title there. But chef owner of Area and has a long history in Miami, having uh, been born and raised there, and really embraces the heritage, the culinary heritage that he has um, inherited um, from his family's roots in the Cuban uh, cultures. And he's incredibly passionate about really informing the world of the potential of Cuban cultures, starting with kind of the, the landing place of Miami. Um, and we were talking earlier and, and about the, the role of, of Cuban culture in uh, particular is a really interesting one, just given the kind of political history of what mm. you've been um, you know, dealing with or handed. Right. Um, do we want to play the video now? You want to make a quick introduction? Um. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome, Chef. Yeah. Uh, my name is Mike Beltran. I'm the chef and owner of Ariad Hospitality Group. Uh, I think the video is a good place to start. All right. Let's roll that. The purpose of Ariad as a restaurant was for me to help better understand the story of what it was, what it is to be Cuban-American growing up in Miami. And two things that stuck out to me the most were, you know, braised oxtail and sweet plantains. You know, sweet plantains are usually thought of as like a, an afterthought, but an afterthought because they're just a side. The thought process was how to develop that, how to refine that, how to look at that through a different lens. Raised oxtail, my grandfather cooking that for me 20 plus years for my birthday meant a lot, but then how do you re-envision that entire setup? How do you re-envision that entire preparation and evolve it and show a reinterpretation of things that, that shows uh, a different side of creativity that Cuban Americans or Cubans weren't allowed to have after being oppressed for 60 years. The hope for me when it comes to the monkfish and Sendio dish is that it shows this evolution that we are progressing. I was having a conversation with a good friend of mine, art critic Ricardo Payosa, and he said something that resonates with me still to this day. For the people who see themselves inside of a Cuban context, Cuba is dead. The ones who see Cuba as in them, and they are the context, Cuba is alive. And what that means for me, and for our story at Ariette specifically, is that we are allowed to tell our own story. We are allowed to grow that story. If there's somebody in 20 years from now that says, you know what, there was a Cuban American kid in Miami that took this thing and did something different with it. It really shows that thinking outside of a box that we were forced to live in for so long, it shows that fighting against that box is really what beautiful food really stands for. If I had nothing else to the world, that is something that I am extremely, extremely proud of. Nice, that's a nice introduction. I think that was a lot of information in two minutes. Um, mm -hmm. So a very long story to tell. And I think one of my goals specifically, and I think this like seminar, what we're talking about is like reinterpreting a cuisine. And I don't think that what we do at Ariad is reinterpreting. I think what we do is keep alive. Mm -hmm. And not only keep alive, but we show progress. We show creativity. We show personality and something that the Cuban people haven't been allowed to do for 60 plus years. So um, I'm going to try to jam two dishes into 22 minutes, so pardon me if I 
fumble at all, but the first dish that we're going to do is kind of our staple dish, and it's uh, pan-seared foie gras with uh, plantain pave and a temptation caramel. So the reason why this dish to me is so important to our restaurant specifically is because we took something that was so common in Cuba and for my people really, which is plantains, and we elevated them with something that you would never ever see in Cuba at all, right? Which is foie. Um, the way that I was brought up cooking and the things that I learned, uh, I was brought up in French kitchens, uh, classic French things, just like Diego was talking about, lots of butter and cream, and we still use a lot of that. Sorry, I'm gonna light it up in here. My bad. And, um, you know, I was always fascinated with kind of the luxury aspect of things and things that growing up I didn't really have a lot of access to. You know, like we, we ate cheap, we lived modest and humble, and I think that's pretty something that's, that's very common for the Cuban people overall. So, you know, grade A foie, seared off pretty simply, only with salt. Um, a plantain pave, which is right over here. This takes two days to make, so we pre-made it for you guys. And um, the idea was to elevate, again, you know, we take plantains, semi-ripe, we layer them, we press them, and then we lightly fry them. So it gives, it gives that stacked, I don't know, you guys can't see, I don't know where the thing is, but it gives that like stacked, um, kind of like layered plantain, which, you know, for me, the first time that we did this, I was incredibly enamored with it because we took something that was so humble, like a plantain, and we elevated it, and we made it something completely different. Um, so your foie is cooked nicely. Okay. Discard this thing. Temptation caramel. Um, Temptation caramel is an old school Cuban preparation that's usually supposed to preserve plantains. So the whole idea behind it was to take an acidic, semi-sweet sauce, and when the plantains are so dark, you know, because they get very black and they start busting at all the seams, um, you're tempted to throw them away. So instead of doing that, you do temptation caramel. Temptation caramel is a combination of cherry vinegar, sour oranges, lots of shallots, lots of onion, lots of spices. And um, this dish was actually inspired by my grandparents' backyard. My grandparents, they've lived in the same home since they came here from Cuba 50 years ago. And in their backyard, in the middle of the city, they have just one tree, and that one tree is a sour orange tree. So I grew up having roasted pork and roasted chicken, all with uh, sour oranges from that tree. And I always wondered to myself, is there something that we could do other than just marinate proteins with it? So I challenged myself and my team, how can we reinterpret something that is so common for the Cuban people and for, I think, people in general around the world as more than just a marinade? And that's what we did with this dish, I think. So this dish has been on the Ariat menu since day one. Um, it's had, you know, different lives, I believe, but it's incredibly simple. It's only three ingredients, but the depth of purpose and the depth of like flavor here is really what that restaurant and the cuisine of what we do there really means. So that is the plantain pave with pan roasted foie gras and temptation caramel. Beautiful. Thank you. So for our second dish, um, as I was mentioning in the video, I grew up, I mean, my grandfather is the real cook. My grandparents, my grandmother is an exceptional cook, but she always just did the beans. My grandfather always did the protein. And um, like gifts for me were always in the form of food. My grandfather would ask me, he's like, so what do you want for your birthday? And I would say, you know, I want Raul Encendio and I want camarón enchilado. That's what I want. I want to have 
dinner, and I want those two things to be cooked. So I think, I mean, the, the idea of braised oxtail and like the romance and the luxury of what braised oxtail really means, I think, you know, has changed a lot. Um, but to me, it's this like humble, very like honest experience of like eating with your family. And, uh, you know, for Cubans, like all we really have is that table with food right now. You know, that thing that connects us to our island and to our people. Because we can never go back, right? So, Ariad specifically, the, the idea was to elevate the cuisine and it was to uh, give people a different vision or idea of what Cuban cuisine really means. At least means to me, right? I was born in Miami, uh, grew up in this very like push and pull nature of like, are you American, are you Cuban? Like, where do you really, where do you land? And it's tough. You know, a lot of kids my age, and I think, you know, that decade before and after, they live in this almost like state of like, we are, how do you turn this thing on over here? This like children of the lost feeling. You know, like we don't know if we, we reside with American people, we don't know if we reside with Cuban people because the Cubans are still there and we don't know. The only connection we have is through food. The only connection we have is through music and stories. So. I wanted to be able to tell a story of progress, creativity, things of that nature. And I think that's what this dish really stands for. So um, I, I think this was actually a mistake. We got some monkfish tails. Um, and we just wanted monkfish loin. And to me, it looked a lot like oxtail. And I was like, man, like, what if we just braised this like oxtail? And then my wonderful chef that's over here to the left was like, I don't know, that's kind of weird. And I said, but that's cool. Weird is fine. So we took this monkfish and we braised it in, uh, first you flour it, you sear it the same way we treat oxtail. We do this the exact same way. Um, flour it, sear it in a pan. And then the process after that is, it's just like braising oxtail. The difference is it takes 25 minutes instead of four hours. Mm -hmm. So sear it in the pan, and then you have obviously your veg, mirepoix veg, you have garlic, you have red wine for deglazing. And then uh, Chef Manny actually discovered a bay leaf tree that was outside time. And to me, this, this dish, when it lived on the menu, because it's not on the menu currently, but when it lived on the menu, it was the thing I was the most proud of on our entire menu. And I love, it's like, that menu itself is like, for me, it's the greatest hits of like my kids throughout the last six years, right? We, we have evolved so much and we have changed so much. And I think that the cuisine itself has taken so many like turns throughout time. But the one thing that's stayed the same is that we wanted to tell a story that for some reason keeps on getting lost in translation, right? Which is Cubans as a people are not just the things I think that society dictates us to be, which is a Cuban sandwich, or tropa vieja, or vaca frita, which all those things are delicious, but that does not dictate who we are. Creativity, progress, and I think um, pushing for something more really represents who we are, and things like this, dishes like this really showcase that for me. So, steer these bad boys off, get a little bit of color. Okay, as they're searing, add your veg. Okay. Yeah, you can take that. And then here, a pot on the side, I have uh, already like a pre-mixed, kind of like 50-50 stock of lobster stock and veal stock. So we take the veal stock down to like 50%, so it's not quite a demi. But in the process, you'll see it comes down quite a bit. The lobster stock, the same way. Take lobster bodies, roast them off. Standard stock. Um, you take that lobster stock, you reduce it down 50% of the way as well. Some color. Add some garlic. Okay. Okay. 
But you don't want to get too much color on the monkfish itself because obviously it is a fish and it'll cook a lot faster than oxtail will. So you really want that flour in there because the flour is going to give body to your sauce at the very end, right? It's just like classic braising, you know? Flour something, sear something, you create a fond in the pan, and then that fond eventually will live on in the finished product. So. So over here I have red wine. You can use any red wine. You can use cab. Tomato paste and obviously the aromatics. So once you get a little bit of color here, good amount of tomato paste. Make sure the tomato paste is covering all the veg. You're going to deglaze with your red wine. Once you deglaze with the red wine, you don't want to take it all the way down to sec. You want it to live at like a 50% reduction because you still want to have that red wine flavor and that body in the sauce, your final product. Add your aromatics. Fresh bay leaf. I mean, you can find it. It's always better. Dry bay leaf is fine, but fresh is the best. Add your thyme. This looks good. So from here, you're going to add your monkfish back. Just like nestle it in. Reduce down your heat. And then add your stock. So, like I said earlier, monkfish is not like braising oxtail itself. The braise itself takes about 25 minutes. Depends on the size of the fish. 25 to 30, depending where you're at. And then from here, you pop this into the oven, let it ride. So once it's done for 25 minutes, which in the world of movie magic, mm -hmm. we already have a finished product. Once that comes out, it should look just like this. Mm, wow. From here, sauce has been reduced. Monkfish is cooked completely. You still have some veg from your braise, which you will remove eventually. But if you could see here, the, um, the sauce itself has body now, right? It's gone thick. And that's from that beginning part of adding flour to the actual sauce itself. It's a beautiful thing. Okay. So now we can start building our plate. One second. We got it. Okay. So you can use a bowl, you can use a plate. Like I said, you know, our thing was to take a certain, I would say like, a lot of variations of Cuban food are looked at as peasant food, right? It's just like homey and comforting and um, beautiful and family oriented. And we wanted to take that and we wanted to change it. We wanted to finesse it. We wanted to elevate it. We wanted to show a different side of what something was commonly known as normal. Because in my mind, it's not normal. So. Um, over here, you have a variation of local veg. Um, you know, this dish has different variations because we use whatever's in season, whatever's from the farm. 
Uh, actually, all these veg minus these, uh, all three of these things here, we found that a farmer's market the day before yesterday. And that's kind of like a huge change in what people perceive as Cuban food to be. Because if you look at the traditional Cuban table, there are no vegetables, right? Um, it's just a lot of meat, a lot of rice, a lot of beans, which there's nothing wrong with. But, um, you know, we wanted to change that dynamic and really be as seasonal, as local as we could be with a cuisine that wasn't known for that. Again, that's something that shows progress, evolution, creativity, something that, again, our people haven't had the opportunity to do. So, you know, this regular white rice, uh, we take the white rice, we finish it with a little bit of uh, extra virgin olive oil and uh, zested lime. And it's just a little bit of that at the bottom. Try to keep it as tight as possible. Okay. And you take your monk and you're gonna start building your plate. So we wrap the monkfish with butcher's twine. So you're gonna have to take that off. Chef Manny's ahead of the game, he already took it off. Nestle it on there. Okay. So then you take your veg, room temp, or you could lightly warm them up in water, whatever you prefer. And then you just start to plate. I keep these turnips raw because they're tiny and they're beautiful, so there's no need to mess with them too much. Okay. Manny, can you hear me the green oil? And then for the sauce, I'm going to finish it around the plate. Before I do that, I'm going to finish it with a little bit of lemon juice to give it some kind of acid. Thank you. So the tops of these onions we took and we just made a little bit of a green oil for them. And always finish with crunchy salt. And this is monkfish para un sandio. That's beautiful. <laughs> Chef, monkfish is, it's a pretty hearty fish. So that, I mean, it, that looks like, right? That, that yep. could pass as a, as a good meat dish. And I, I know being from Maine, monkfish is called the poor man's lobster in Maine because it just really eats beautifully, right? Yeah, I mean, in Miami, um, I didn't have a lot of experience with monkfish. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, it was a mistake, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And we got yeah. it in and, um, you know, we tried it several different ways and I was like, you know, this just makes sense to me in this fashion, which was braised and uh, I thought it was it worked out really well. You know, some experiments don't always work, uh, yeah. but this one actually worked. That's so, beautiful. Very good clever and, and, and really, you know, savvy and elevated, as you were saying. And yeah. I was using the term protect and preserve. I meant, I really, but you were saying progress and preserve. And that's a, that's a slight differentiation when it comes to, um, to what your, your mission is, right? You really were talking about the evolution of where this, where, you know, Cuban can go right. on um, outside of, of its country. Well, I, th I think that um, there's a lot of misconceptions right, right now. There's right. a lot of, um, I think, assumptions about what the culture 
really is. And what the culture is, has it's been oppressed for a very long time. Yes. You know, and right. I'm fortunate enough that my family fled and they provided the opportunity for me to be mm -hmm. here in front of you guys. Mm -hmm. And that's why my mission um, forever has been to preserve but progress right. and to show a side of the culture that people don't really know. And I think to an extent, we're living in this very interesting time. You know, the country's going through a lot of things. And the city of Miami, which has so many deep roots of so many different cultures, but especially Miami gave an opportunity to Cubans to thrive. And, you know, that's why I love my city so much. And that's why I try to represent for my city so much. But the Cubans there, I mean, there's a, there's a longing for what they've lost. And I think that's why Miami's become such a home for them, because they mm -hmm. can have a semblance of that, mm -hmm. you know, and they can have that freedom that they yearn for and at the same time be um, creative and mm -hmm. be passionate and really be who they are, not be who someone else told them to be. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's well said. Any questions from the audience for, for either chefs? Actually, uh, hey. Chef Diego, you want to come back out here? He's right there. There you are. Great. Any, any questions on these dishes or for the chefs? We can shut up. Chef? Did you two ever get together and do a little fusion cooking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we cooked together. Uh, we cooked like, oh, together like eight months yeah. ago, no? Yeah. Yeah. How about We're lucky that the uh, community in Miami, I'm new. No, I've been there eight years. Yeah. But what I like most is that there's a community and we're very tight. Mm -hmm. uh, that the chef community, we're all friends, we support each other. And we work for one uh, goal, no, is yep. to to represent Miami. Mm -hmm. I'm the new one, no. Yeah, but I mean, I'm it's uh, Miami's gone through this <clears throat> incredible growth uh, over the last decade, and Diego's part of that growth. Um, for the last like 30 years, there have been people that have been pushing the envelope of Miami food, and I think right now we're at this very interesting time that the community is super tight and people support each other and people show a lot of love and people want everyone to win. And I don't think every community is like that, but I think Miami is. I think we understand that mm -hmm. the key of success of the city of Miami or the state of Florida is that we all work together, no? Mm -hmm. As the Peruvian culture, no? Peru is so popular now uh, because of course of the ingredients and flavors, but uh, the community of chefs in Peru, we all know that we work, we're, we all work, we all have our own companies, but we all know in Peru that we work for one big company that is called Peru. Yeah. No? And I think in Miami it's happening the same, and I think it's very successful. It it's, will be. Miami is interesting in that you've got a lot of high end cuisine that allows you to take kind of the humble roots and express them in, in really elevated, reinterpreted ways, right? It's a unique market for that, would you say? There's a contrasting of kind of the street food level and the humble uh, Cuban roots there, but very high-end as well. It's a new. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have an interesting perspective on that because yeah. I think Miami is known as this like touristy, like smoke and mirrors right, place. Right, right. And that's, there's a lot of that, and that's yeah. true. But I think that the true core of the community is not only supporting people like us, which do higher end cuisine right. and fancy things and uh, cook in fancy dining rooms, but they're also supporting the small mom and pop. They're also supporting the place that's been there for 35 years. Mm -hmm. And that's why, like Diego said, the community is so strong. Yeah, no, that makes sense, makes sense. We had a question from, um, from a viewer on uh, Chef Diego, the leaves, touching back to your dish, the leaves and the flowers you used, what, was, what were those? Uh, pea shoots. Pea shoots. And violas. And violas, of uh, violets? Yeah. yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. great, great, okay. All right, yeah. any other questions from the uh, viewing audience? Um, uh, what else do you guys see going forward in your, um, in your explorations of your cuisine? Like, what are you really excited about when it comes to um, putting something or reinterpreting what's next? Like you, uh, Chef Michael, plantains and, and potatoes, and what other ingredients are you excited about, about you know, bringing upscale, or, or not necessarily upscale, just inspirational? 
you? You, you first, you first. <laughs> <laughs> so um, well, I think inspiration can come in, at any Absolutely. time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, me personally, of course, I want to promote my country through the food. And not only the food, but I, I want to promote my country, the culture. And I think uh, me as an immigrant to this country or any country, uh, and as a chef, I will promote my ingredients, my traditions, flavors, and of course, adapting to the place that I am. No? Like, I'm adapting to Miami right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't plan too much, I just flow. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I don't have a, like a, a plan. Yes, I don't right. know, I just keep, do what I like. and for what strikes uh, you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Any other thoughts, Mike? Yeah, I mean, it's like he said, is um, what inspires me is to, to tell the story and to yeah. preserve a right. story and to progress the story mm -hmm. at the same time. But also like showcasing the city of Miami and the artisans that are there and the incredible community that's there. It's, it's a drive. It's like a, there's a driving force of that. Because being born and raised there, you know, um, we, we don't get a lot of love all the time. And that's cool, right, you know, right, and it's right. our job to push the envelope mm -hmm. because it's just part of what we're doing. And I think we see it, and I think Diego's right, you see it every day, and um, I'm incredibly proud to be part of this new wave yeah. that you see. No, you're, you're right, you're both in the right place for it, and it's, it's really exciting and, and um, innovating and inspirational to those of you looking into Nikkei cuisine or, or Cuban Cuban cuisine and job well done. Any other last questions? We're wrapping up before we wrap up. All right. Oh yes, go ahead, Barb. Hi. 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 Yes, ma'am. Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> but, but that's a different look at it. Yeah. We're so typical of having either a very lemony, you know, olive yeah. oil type sauce, right. or white sauce, or not a very good thing. Something, you know, light and white. Yeah. I do love Bernays, though. It's mm -hmm. good. Um, yeah, I think that the the protein tells you what you should do with it. And um, I think that that, that ideology albeit the norm, isn't totally correct. Like, uh, currently at the restaurant, we do conch, um, like, in the style of bourguignon. So mm. instead of doing it with beef bourguignon, we do it with conch. And we serve it with bone marrow butter, and we serve it with tornado potatoes. And, you know, again, it's taking something that, like, people think is very Caribbean um, and doing it in a different way. And I was skeptical that that dish wasn't going to work either. And... Um, I mean, you know, the, we, we shouldn't it. follow it rules, right? Yeah? We shouldn't follow rules. No, I mean, yeah. I'm not no. for just like rules and guidelines. Rules are more guidelines when it comes to food. Yeah. And I think that um, if one thing I would implore everyone is that you don't have to do things the way that they've been done forever. I mean, just like the way that he was plating a causa, which is mm -hmm. beautiful and like interesting and I, I mean, I've always been enamored with that gausa from like far away, and when I go there, it says, I'm like, this is gorgeous, mm. you know? And there's nothing wrong with the original one, yeah, but it's just, it's different, you know? And, and conch, um, uh, that's something that everyone was like, well, you know, you need to do conch salad. And I'm like, well, we could do this. This is fine. <laughs> you know, this is also delicious. And we did the same thing with the monkfish, you know? It's, and it's all, it is a lighter version of braised oxtail. Right. It's just right. not oxtail. You know, and that's the way that we looked at it. And it, I'm happy that it worked out. <laughs> that's great. All right, chefs, thank you so much for awesome. coming. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you to our amazing chef. Thank you to Kathy. And big thanks also to our sponsor, Kiko Man Sales USA, for this session. We are now heading into a 45 minute break and flavor discovery tasting. So I will welcome everyone into the atrium at this time. Our next general session will start in the Ecolab Theater right here at 11 a.m. Thanks everyone.
What's better than chicken fried steak? Chicken fried ham, of course. So let's make this super delicious chicken fried ham with mashed potatoes and ham gravy. We'll get started by making our breading station. In one bowl, combine the breadcrumbs, parsley, paprika, cayenne, salt, and black pepper. You'll need another bowl of flour. And in the third bowl, whisk together the eggs and milk. Sprinkle both sides of the ham steak with kosher salt and black pepper. Then coat both sides in the flour. Place the meat into the egg and milk mixture, turning to coat. Finally, place it in the breadcrumbs and turn to coat. Now we'll cook our ham steaks. Heat oil in a large skillet over medium heat. Add the butter. Cook the ham steaks until the edges start to look golden brown, about two minutes on each side. Remove the meat to a paper towel lined pan and keep them warm. Now we'll make our ham gravy. Pour off the oil into a heat proof bowl. Without cleaning the skillet, return it to the stove over medium low heat. Add two tablespoons of the oil back to the skillet with some butter and allow it to heat up. When the oil is hot, add the diced ham and saute for a few minutes to get some nice color and flavor. Add the onions and garlic and continue to saute until soft and nicely colored. Sprinkle the flour evenly over the hot pan. Mix the flour with the oil, cooking until golden brown. Pour in the milk, stirring constantly, and bring this to a simmer. Add the salt, lemon juice, and cayenne to taste, and cook, stirring constantly until the gravy is smooth and thick, five to 10 minutes. You can add more milk if it's too thick. Be sure to taste to make sure gravy is sufficiently seasoned. Now we're ready to serve. Plate the chicken fried ham with a side of mashed potatoes, your favorite vegetables, and the gravy on top. There you have it, chicken fried ham with mashed potatoes and ham gravy. Enjoy. Find this recipe and many more at ciaprochef.com slash ham. The Culinary Institute of America at Copia, in collaboration with Butter of Europe, is pleased to bring you Baking and Pastry Excellence, a free online educational series featuring the best in world baking and pastry. Today, we'll visit the Manresa Bakery in Los Gatos, California, with head baker Avery Rizika. Chef Rizika shows us the secrets to making her classic pastry, originally from Brittany, France, Kunamans, deliciously layered with raspberry plum jam and creamy French butter. Hi, my name is Avery Rizika. I'm the partner, founder, and head baker at Manresa Bread in Los Gatos. Today we're making a kudamon with raspberry jam. So the kudamon dough consists of flour, water, butter, and a little bit of malt syrup and yeast. So now that we, we mix our dough, we refrigerate it for about four to five hours. It could go as long as overnight. And then we take our dough and we take our butter of Europe and we are going to lock it together. So we've sheeted our butter out slightly, um, but you wanna bring your dough, initial dough out till it's about one and a half times the size of your butter. Then we lay the butter on top of the dough. After locking in the butter, we're gonna give it a double fold. Um, after 30 minutes, we bring it back to the sheeter. We rotate it 90 degrees, we lengthen it out. We give it a, another double fold and then we are going to top that double fold with sugar and we don't have to rest it this time. And then we're going to sheet out the dough again and we're going to give it another fold and we're going to top that with sugar again and then we're going to start to sheet it out. When we sheet it out, we are going to add the last of our sugar. Um, because we're filling this with jam, we instead just keep it one long roll and we move it to a work table. Uh, we fill it with our fresh made raspberry and plum jam and we roll it up like you would a cinnamon roll or something like that. And then we cut that log into two inch um, widths um, that when it's time to proof will be placed on their cut side and they'll proof out into a mold for about 45 minutes to an hour. And then they'll bake for about 12 minutes at about 370 degrees Fahrenheit. 
I like Butter of Europe for the Kunamon because of the fat content. The thing that I love about Kunamon is how immediate the butteriness comes through. I think that the combination of the butter and the sugar, I mean, that's just a classic combination in and of itself. The fat from the butter with the sugar caramelizes in the oven. So the minute you take a bite of that pastry, you're getting that butter flavor, that some of those texture differences from the bake um, hitting your tongue. And I think that it's just, you know, it's just a wonderful, wonderful, delicious thing to eat. Watch more baking and pastry videos at ciaproshef.com slash butter. Hi, I'm Andrew Hunter, chef for Kikuman Sales USA. Today we're gonna make crispy pork lumpia with a sweet soy lemon dipping sauce. So we're going to blend ground pork with roasted mushrooms and lots of aromatics, garlic, ginger, scallions, to create a super flavorful filling that we then roll several times in a lumpia wrapper and fry so it's really crispy. The trick is to get them from the fryer to the plate to the table as quick as possible so they're hot and crispy. We'll start by preparing sweet lemon soy dipping sauce. In a saucepan, we'll combine the following Kikoman sauces. Citrus seasoned ponzu, less sodium soy sauce, coteri mirin, brown sugar, rice vinegar, and lemon juice. Bring the sauce to a simmer over medium heat until the sugar is dissolved. Remove the saucepan from the heat and allow the sauce to cool. Once cool, whisk in the lemon zest and set this sauce aside. Now for the lumpia filling. In a small nonstick skillet over a medium flame, add oil and heat until it's rippling. Add garlic, ginger, and green onions, stir several times, then turn the heat to low and cook slowly until the aromatics are very soft, about five minutes. Remove from the heat and cool to room temperature in a large mixing bowl. Whisk in the black pepper and soy sauce. Combine the pork and roasted mushrooms and whisk in the eggs. Work pork and mushrooms with your hands to mix, similar to kneading dough. Add one tablespoon of water at a time while you mix until the pork looks emulsified. Refrigerate for four to 24 hours for the pork flavors to blend and marinate. Now we're ready to make the lumpia. I filled a pastry bag with the lumpia filling. Pipe the filling in a straight line lengthwise along the top of the lumpia wrapper, leaving a small space at both ends. Brush the other end of the wrapper with egg wash. Fold the lumpia wrapper over the pork and roll into a nice tight stick. Heat the oil to 365 degrees Fahrenheit. Slowly drop the lumpia into the oil until immersed and fry until a deep golden brown, about one minute. Here you have the crispy lumpia with the sweet soy lemon dipping sauce, great for passing or sharing. One of the signatures, it's not only the rub, it's not only the sauce, but it's the wood they cook with. The wood I could get all the time was hickory. People talk about hickory being a really strong flavored wood. I think the way I use it, I minimalize that. I offset it by a really clean fire. Hickory can be strong. I would move the wood around. I would try and keep it over a bed of coals. A clear light blue smoke is really good. A, a, a heavy, dark, black colored smoke is, is, is not so good. I, I recommend typically to everybody cooking barbecue, 
run the smallest fire that you can get away with because a fire that will breed and gets plenty of oxygen will produce a better flavored smoke than, than a fire that's too big and smoldering. By doing log cabin style where we just place two pieces of wood as needed, probably every 15 minutes or so, and allowing the gaps there, it, it'll breathe. I like to treat smoke as a, as a seasoning, as a flavor, and, and I want that smoke to be pleasant smoke. You've been to places where they burn wood down to coals mm -hmm. and then they add those coals to the whole hog. That's the most, that, that's such a mild smoke and, and it's so nice. So you can see the smoke starting to kick out of that end piece right now. But back before I did um, smaller pieces of wood, and it was inevitable that these larger logs would always have a piece uh, where the, the end wasn't over the coals and it would just put out a lot of smoke. So that, I didn't invent this. This is called the Minion Method. A fellow named Jim Minion came up with it. The idea behind the Minion Method is to get a, a long cook, not have it get too hot on you. You can see what I've done is I've just kind of made like a, a, a run of charcoal. You could come in at this point with a, a chimney full of charcoal and, and just light a, a few amount of briquettes. And once those briquettes are going, we just pour those to one end of the run of the charcoal. And the idea behind it is it just kind of weeps along, doesn't get too hot, and you get a longer burn. The idea with this would be, in this case, I'm just gonna take some, some coals and I'm gonna put them right here. And I'm just cheating with the fire that I have in, in the fire pit. But we'll just kind of let that cruise and get going and then do a slow burn all the way around. Depending on how much fuel we put over here to start, we could probably have this pit up in, uh, at our operational temperature, you know, desired temperature in 30 to 45 minutes. Let's find out. So they're looking pretty good. Uh, I gotta say, yours look really good. Um, you're surprised? No, I'm okay. not. I'm not. <laughs> you, you're running this show for a reason. So, anyways, we're going to go and wrap them now. All right, so I say we start with the meat side up, and you can just tell by that bend that they're, they're just not quite cooked all the way. So this is up to you. It's chef's choice. This, as I was saying, is this is an opportunity or a place where we can add in a little bit more flavor. For me, I'm just going to reinforce my rub a little bit more and just come in with a light sprinkle. Man, yours smells good. Doesn't that smell good? Smell it. I took a shower. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I just hit it with a little moisture, and you can too. And then I'm just gonna flip it, and I'm going to meat side down, and do it again. Tuffy just add water. Tuffy didn't approve of the apple juice that he had. Yeah, I know. It, wasn't up it was a little, it was a little cloudy. So when I wrap, there's a couple of things that I do. I wrap it in a way to where I, I can unwrap it and check it later. The other thing when wrapping ribs is I don't want to puncture the aluminum foil with the bones. The so focus. I always fold this way first. And I fold this way. And I fold this way. This looks about like the way I uh, wrap a present. Not very good. <laughs> so now I'm going to put this back on the grill, on the cool side, meat side down, and when I go to check it when I'm ready, I can just unwrap it that way with ease versus if I just crinkled it all up. So we're going back to the cool side, meat side down, had about two hours of smoke on them. They're looking kind of tender. If we start to bend it back and the meat starts to tear like that, they're done. Okay. We could take a toothpick. We could go right through the meat. We could take a thermometer and they'd probably be about 205 to 210 degrees Fahrenheit. So you saw us and I'll flip. Some of the things that I think, uh, some of the things that I think people make a mistake with when it comes to sauce is, especially when it comes to grilled and smoked meats, is we don't cook the meat until it's uh, tender before we sauce it. I think sometimes we get in this rush. We think, man, I gotta get this dinner ready. So I'm going to add a little sauce to it, even though the meat's not done. This sauce and many barbecue sauces have uh, sugar in them. And if, it's, if that sauce gets too hot, 
it burns, as you well know. So I always recommend that the saucing be a finishing step, that it be something, you cook the meat until it's tender, and then at the end, we apply the sauce, and we don't add too much, too much sauce to it. I think that uh, your best barbecue doesn't need any sauce at all. I, I think your ribs that we're gonna be getting to after we get these on the grill will probably uh, reinforce that idea. So we'll just take this one back over here to the grill and let it just heat up. So this is the, uh, the savory oh, rib. Oh. oh my goodness. <laughs> and it's perfect. All right, so this is something that I personally recommend. It's so much easier to cut a rack of ribs with the bone side up, because we can come in with our knife. And it guides and, you. And that's right. Um, I don't know, I think you did a good job. And this is, it smells great. And if this was overcooked, they'd be falling apart even trying to cut them right now. So it's a very fine line between tag and just right to either over or under. That's right. A little spritz. And if you wanted to, just a little sprinkle. There you go, ma'am. I'm Tony Roberts. I'm the pastry chef at the Ritz Carlton Chicago. Today we're celebrating the worlds of flavor with the perfect puree of Napa Valley. So we're going to start the day in Montreal for breakfast with black pepper ham and Emmental crepes with the perfect puree peach ginger blend and maple sauce. And then we're going to follow up with the butter. I'm going to switch to a whisk here. Just get the butter in and just whisk until the butter is melted in. And Emmental cheese and ham, we're gonna give it a fold, give it another fold. So we're just gonna pour this right over the top. And then to finish, some fresh black pepper and some chopped herbs. Today I have some chive and there you go a beautiful brunch or breakfast dish. Next up on our culinary journey, we're stopping in Mexico City for vegetarian cauliflower tacos with a peach ginger slaw. We are going to add our peach ginger blend. So here we have our coleslaw, everything's in. We have our peach ginger blend, it smells so good. Some white vinegar, fresh lime juice, and some toasted chopped pepitas. So we're just gonna take our plate here. I have our warm corn tortillas. I'm gonna do a little bit of the spicy mayo. A few crispy fried onions. And there you have it. Roasted cauliflower tacos with the peach ginger slaw. So we're finishing our day with some sweets in Sao Paulo. And go ahead and blend it smooth. So here we have our brigadero mixture. And then from here, just use a little ice cream scoop or you can use a spoon or something else. And you're just going to make little balls, pop them out and then in your hands, roll them nicely into a little ball. And here I have some yellow nonpareil sprinkles and some orange to celebrate the peach ginger colors. And we're just gonna take our little ball Roll it in here, cover it in the sprinkles. And then these just get placed in bonbon cups, ready for your guests. I've had so much fun on this culinary journey with the perfect puree of Napa Valley. We began our day in Montreal where we made black pepper ham and Emmental crepes with a peach ginger sauce. 
Next up, we headed to Mexico City to prepare vegetarian roasted cauliflower tacos with a peach ginger slaw. Then we ended our day with sweets in San Palio with peach ginger brigaderos. Again, all of these recipes can be found at www.perfectpuree.com slash W-O-F. While you're there, remember to check out our complimentary sample program and try all of the flavors for yourself. Enjoy.